Regain your financial freedom by grabbing the book Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power, an Amazon bestseller written by none other than Dr. Boyce Watkins. Grab the book now. Also, Heating Up Summer 2023, Be One the Movie, starring Dr. Claude Anderson, Madam President, and Riza Islam. Atlanta, Georgia, get ready. The All-Black National Convention is coming your way October 2023. We had the privilege of attending an All-Black National Convention. It was an absolutely life-changing experience. To get a free Dr. Boyce Watkins Black Business School training on how to make money without working, text the word STOCK to 31996. Welcome to another episode of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother Oga from Hip Hop News Uncensored and sitting across from me is my co-host. What up, what up, y'all? It's your man Sam and CEO of Viral Hip Hop News. You're in the building for a very special edition of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. We got on the podcast today, Debowski's on the podcast. What's good with you, family? How you feeling? Bless, man, bless. Word, man. Happy to have you on. Now, for the people who don't know who you are, let's give a little bit of a backstory. Now, you are the quote-unquote online and various media publications, the super fan of R. Kelly. You were the brother that got convicted and got hit with some pretty heinous crimes. I never got convicted. I never got convicted? No. You were accused? Yeah, I was accused. Sorry for the for the for the misinterpretation. Oh, accused of some very heinous things, accused of threatening and doing all kind of other stuff, man. But we're gonna get to your story, your side of the story today on the podcast, man. But before we do, man, I mean, a lot of smoke has settled since those accusations on your part. So how 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 are you feeling now, just after all the dust has settled and, and R. Kelly has now been um sentenced? He's behind bars for a very long time. How how's everything in your world right now? Uh, a little paranoid. Mm. Uh, when I see suburbans, uh, tinted out uh, SUVs, you know, a little post traumatic stress from from this whole situation. Right. Due to the fact of how they took me into custody, you know, surrounding me, putting guns all in my face. Uh, if they had been in the streets or something like that, if they was on some street time, I would have been out of there. You know what I mean? Right. You just know that you could be walking down the street and somebody can snatch you up and disappear you until they decide when they're going to tell your people that they got you was a, a experience I won't forget. Right. So let's go. To, let's go to the beginning of the whole ordeal. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a clip of you. You know, um, I guess you're doing a podcast. It's a five minute clip where they're pretty much trying to say or alleging that you pretty much threatened to you know, run up on a prosecutor's run up in a courthouse, right? Right. So when that, you know, you do the clip, how long ago after that? I, I, I never made a clip. I made a, I was on a full podcast where uh, yeah. people, people was calling right. in. I was reading paperwork of uh, R. Kelly's indictment, uh, the motions that was filed at that time. And out of that 10 hour podcast, somebody took five minutes. Right. And they uploaded the five minute video. And the gotcha. government thought I did. And, and they right. not only thought that I uploaded the five minute video, they thought that that was the end of it, that just that five minutes. Right. So, so that happens. And take us to the day you were telling me you were walking down the street, you see a guy coming to um, a suburban, and then they pull up on the curb and they get you. Take us right to that spot if you can. I'm walking down the street, I'm talking on the phone. I see a, a brown suburban come through with one guy inside of the suburban, but he has on a, a bulletproof vest that's not a cop vest. It's like a, one of the war vests that mm -hmm. you see them wearing over there in Iraq. It was mm -hmm. like a, a football. You know how the football <laughs> thing go. It was like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when he rolled past, I'm like, this little guy in this big vest, I told the person on the phone, I'm like, I just seen some weird police guy. And as I'm saying it, I look over my shoulder, and I see a vehicle driving over the curb through the grass straight at me full speed. So I'm like, oh, oh, whoa, whoa. The guy jumps out the passenger side. He gets on the hood of the car with his gun. The other cars start coming. So I knew that I wasn't going to be able to run, go nowhere, nothing like that. And I can tell that these was not police officers. I can tell, like, these dudes been to war. You can tell that they've been deployed somewhere and you can tell that they right. done did this type of stuff <laughs> pretty a, a lot they get me into the vehicle i'm sitting cuffed in the back of the vehicle one officer on each side of me and i'm asking them what's going on what did i do what did i do 
And they was like, we'll tell you when we get you to the station. And I was like, where are we going? Because they just going through the lights. It's, it's two Suburbans in front of us uh, and probably one in the back of us. They're not stopping. They just going, like, where are we going? To New York. I'm like, New York? <laughs> and keep in mind, I'm scared to fly. So I, I, if I fly, I prepare myself days in advance. Right. Now, you got my heart racing on this end. I'm thinking about, oh, I got to get on this plane. I'm not even ready. So I was a little head spinning, thinking I'm about to go to New York. I just left my kids around the corner. I ain't even mm. get a chance to tell them I'm what's going on. So, mm. yeah. It was, let, me ask you, I, let me ask you a question real quick. I don't mean to cut you off. Did they tell you that they were law enforcement? Did they ever tell you or you just thought you was abducted? Like, At what? first, I thought I was abducted. That's what mm. I said. At first, I'm thinking, what is this? What's going on? And uh, they was not talking to me. And then I was just, you know, maybe if I play it cool, we'll get some conversation flowing. And I just asked him, I was like, did anybody get hurt because of me? Because if somebody got hurt because of me, I'm sorry if somebody got hurt because of me. And the reason why I'm saying that is to just see what his response would be so we can get some right. type of dialogue. And he was like, no, nobody got hurt. I was like, well, when y'all gonna tell me? He was like, I guess when we get you to New York. I was like, I'm going straight to New York? He was like, well, you gotta talk to my boss. And when, my, when the boss uh, get here, then we can have a dialogue. I'm, I don't know what's going on. So uh, they take me to the MCC, which is downtown Chicago federal institution. And I used to do protests at the MCC about COVID-19 being in the building, the guards, they're not wearing their masks, things of that nature. And to go from protesting outside their door to being on the 17th floor, right. it was just crazy. Right. Now you said that you, now all this, from, first of all, this from a podcast. Right. All this from a podcast. So now you said that, how long was the podcast you did? About 10 hours. So you say you did a 10 hour podcast and they took five minutes of that podcast and took that and ran with it to where you were now going from Chicago to New York. Did you ever get a chance to speak to them on their interpretation of that? And did you ever give, were able to give yes. proper context as to what you meant? And can you give proper context now to what you meant um, and what you were, what was distributed in that five minute video as opposed to what was said in those whole 10 hours? On the five minute video uh, that they had, it showed a clip of uh, Boys in the Hood mm -hmm. uh, where Cuban Gooden said, let me out of the car. Yeah. And he walks off. It ends there. Uh, before that, I'm saying that we're going to be doing protests and we're going to uh, go down to the federal prosecution building and ask that they bring charges against these parents. Because at that time, when R. Kelly was first found guilty, text messages came out that the mother was texting is the daughter. So at that time, we had a petition with 500 signatures, and we was going to ask the uh, prosecutors on his case, why didn't why didn't they charge the, the parents? On the clip that they have, uh, it's basically, they're, they're saying, uh, as of last September 2021, the defendant, Christopher Dunn, was aware of a federal investigation of the prosecution of Kelly and discussed that the investigation and prosecution in various social media content. On September 3rd, 2021, records from the United States District Court for the, the Eastern District of New York indicate that Christopher Dunn signed an overflow courtroom attendance log to publicly view the Kelly trial. Christopher provided a telephone number open source and law enforcement databases search confirms that the number belongs to gun on uh, about october 4th the defendant christopher gun narrated a video get real familiar which was live streamed on youtube the Bosky guns channel i want y'all to get real familiar with this building i'm about to pull up the show to you i'm going to show you exactly where we're going to be going and we're going to get real familiar with this building and this building is going to get real familiar with the enterprise also known as kale steppers we know who's going to stick to everything that I told you, which is if kills go down, they all go down. That's all that, that they had at, at that moment. But wow. when, uh, cause I had sent you the motion that we put in for this yeah. mystery, the, that motion was based off of uh, freedom of speech. And it goes to show what I said after that uh, five minute video, it says that, uh, uh, it goes on to say, Mr. Gunn next. See, this is from from my lawyer. So that that was this is their indictment. Mm -hmm. Eight months later, we got the full video through a Google search warrant, and this is uh, the lawyer's uh, response to. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
It says directly after the charge clip, Mr. Gunn discusses protests and making it clear that his repeated phrase, you don't got the stomach for this reference, is his stomach to protest. And after the boys in the hood clip, Mr. Gunn repeats, if you ain't got the stomach for what's about to go down, bail the fuck out. And nobody's fortunate with you. A lot of our protesters in the future will be held right outside of the United States Attorney's Eastern District of New York office. He repeats, if you don't have the stomach for this, bail out. Everybody that can't make it to the protest in the future, I would like you to call this number. Given the context, it is clear that this and the phrase, you don't got the stomach for this, is a reference to protesting. Mr. Gunn next advised that people who can't protest should call the U.S. Attorney's Office to voice their complaints. As Mr. Gunn continues speaking, his goal of protest and how the prosecutors are handling the R. Kelly's case and specifically their decision to not prosecute the parents of the witnesses become even clearer. He says that anyone who can't come to the protest could instead call the U.S. Attorney's Office. He posts the main number for that office, which is publicly available and appears in the highlighted results of Google. So that's what I actually was saying, that the parents needed to be charged. I was highly upset to see a mother texting as her daughter, uh, telling the daughter that, you know, you should, uh, uh, you're going to have my grandkids. Uh, this guy's going to be, uh, you know, your, your baby's father. This is your last opportunity. You should do it tonight. And when I watched Surviving R. Kelly, I always felt that Surviving R. Kelly was exploitation of black people if, if we don't know where our kids are at at night. You know if your kid didn't come through the door when you went to sleep. You know if your kid, you know, and when you read this, uh, R. Kelly's indictments and the motions that was filed and, and these accusers, how could you be with this man for months and months and months at a time, years at a time, and, and your parents never made a police report? There is no police reports in the R. Kelly situation. And me personally, whether I'm a fan of R. Kelly or not a fan of R. Kelly, I look at everything in the full context. If mm -hmm. you want me to believe that R. Kelly is guilty, then R. Kelly should be in jail by himself. You know, a, a Rico enterprise, when I saw that indictment, how I got involved in this and did protests about it was not about R. Kelly. Simply, it was about the Rico, how they used it. They said the purpose mm -hmm. of the criminal enterprise of R. Kelly was to promote his music and brand. So any entertainer that's out here promoting their music and brand, whether it's Nelly, uh, 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 Young Jeezy, or whoever, if you're promoting your music and brand, you're an artist. That's what artists do. Uh, and any RICO, criminal RICO, two or more people have to come together with the intent to do criminal actions. When I watched the R. Kelly trial in New York, it was R. Kelly sitting at the table by himself. He had no co-defendants in a criminal RICO. And now we're seeing this Rico done scratch to Young Thug and done scratch to multiple other entertainers. And now it's done scratched all the way to the president. But when you see all of these other situations, they have co defenders. R. Kelly has no co defenders at all. And, you know, that, that was something that was missing to me as a person that's viewing the trial and uh, consequences for other people neglecting their children. Uh, was not there. That's another element that was missing. So me, if I was on the jury, which I don't been through the judicial process, I don't think that they sufficiently proved the case. Uh, we know nobody was chained up. We know uh, this man does not uh, fly. So if he travels somewhere for a concert and he's in Texas and you in his house in Chicago, you can leave. And if there's people holding you there and keeping you there, then they should be sitting up here at this table in the courtroom with him. But we didn't see that. And, and the lack of evidence that the government didn't show, it just made me feel like, you know, looking at Surviving R. Kelly, and if you watch the last Surviving R. Kelly, the last one that they did, a lot of those people that they put into that Surviving R. Kelly was people that was coming to view the trial. So it's people mm -hmm. standing in line during the trial, not even knowing that they're being pointed out by accusers, parents, is handlers for R. Kelly. And these are people that I know that did not know these, you know, survive, Surviving R. Kelly, the last one that they filmed, the people that standing in line had no clue that they were going to be in Surviving R. Kelly. They just come in to view the trial. And a lot of people that came to view that trial was highly scrutinized by the government. Right. So... Talk to us about actually, you know, beating the case, 
because the and then the media never talked about it. I never saw the media like give an update. They kind of just put the story out there about oh this crazy fan threatened this, but they didn't give the update. So talk about how you beat the case and talk about the media's lack of coverage of the fact that you beat the case. I believe you know going back to the survivor and R. Kelly, the last one. It mm -hmm. if you watch that, it will show that the prosecutors at that courthouse worked it hand in hand with that production and i believe that once my case was not moving forward the way that they expected mm -hmm. it to be i was not in that production but had it been the way that they wanted it to be i would have been in that production too which let me know the two cross with each other uh mm -hmm. when i when i first got arrested it was june of last year the government found out that this video was longer than five minutes in August. From the moment that they found out what was going on with this video, they took my internet away. I could no longer be on the internet. I I, I had a, this was my phone. This was my phone. Right. Wow. For 10 months. Yeah. So I had no internet. I uh, I didn't really know what was going on in the internet world, but I knew a public defender is is a public defender. So that means this is three friends in the stream. You know what I mean? And I know I got to help this lady if I want to get out of this situation. So by me not being able to go on the internet, I would just go and read case laws. And I always was just asking, can I get the video? When will we get the video? Can I get the video? And we go to court, we ask for the video. They put the video under protective custody or something like that, a protective order. And once they put the video under protective order, it became a grueling eight month wait to get a hold of this video. And uh, during that eight months, it would be uh, random calls being called in to the pretrial services that I did this to this person. I did that to this person, which would be lies. And then I would have to go to court for bond revocations on things that's not even involved in my case. Wow. So then I started feeling like, they not trying to give me the video and then I'm getting these weird complaints that don't have nothing to do with my case. And you're trying to take me into custody every time you get a complaint with no factual basis. So, you know, when I told you that my heart was always racing, yeah. if I was 50 years old, I probably would have stroked out. You know what I mean? My heart stayed racing. Right. And, I, and well, I knew that the only way that I was going to get out of this situation was to get off into these law books. I found a case of Watts versus United States where a guy was protesting uh, against the draft. And he said if he was drafted and they put a gun in his hand, he would the first person he would point at is the president. He got mm -hmm. uh, charged with that and it was proven down the line that that was protected by freedom of speech. It was another guy, Alonis versus United States, where this guy was on Facebook making rap songs about his girlfriend that appeared to be threatening and uh in the end his case was deemed to be freedom of speech so i basing my foundation off of that and all i needed was to get the full video once we got that full video the lawyer seen it first and she contacted me and she was like this whole time you was telling the truth which mean this whole time you didn't believe me you know what i mean so she was like this whole time you've been telling the truth i was like <laughs> well, I've been in the house for 10 months. You know, can I get the leg band off? Can I get a curfew? Can I can I go outside now that you know the truth? She was like, well, I'm going to have to file this motion and blah, blah, blah. She files the motion. The government didn't respond to me for two months. Mm. Now, I'm in, you know, if you would, everybody be like, if you can get house arrest, you at home, you ain't in jail. But yeah. if you can't go out of the house, and you got two kids running around, dog barking, and you can... I couldn't even go outside to play with my kids if they went outside. Wow. So, you know what I mean? The the uh, confinement space was like, it was like the house got smaller. You know what I mean? And uh, I called the government, uh, not the guy that was prosecuting me. I called him. I was like, mm -hmm. you know, basically, you know the truth. You know why I got to keep staying in my house or whatever, you know? And he contacted the lawyer and they told me I can cut the leg band off. I was so happy to go outside. I bet. I go outside. I try to catch up with some of my friends because not everybody knew where I was at. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then they took my phone so I couldn't call people. I wow. found out my best friend had passed away eight months mm. before I had got out the house. 
Mm. Wow. And, and then after after that, I was only out three days at the house. And uh, the pretrial service lady, she contacts me on the flip phone. We talk. She, oh, you got movement now. Yeah, I'm, I got movement. I'm outside. I'm about to take my kids to the park. She said, so is your your your, your church's mom around? I said, yeah, she right here. Well, get her phone and FaceTime me so I can see you. So I FaceTime the lady. She comes on. She's like, oh, you got new glasses. You got new jewelry. Are you working? And when she said that shit to me, I ain't going to lie to you. I felt all kind of racism out of it. <laughs> and I, said, I, I told her, I was like, you know what? I am tired of this shit. I'm tired of you threatening me. I'm tired of all this shit. I don't, I'm, I'm done with this shit. I don't give a fuck no more. And she went and told the judge, and they flew me to New York on a one-way trip. No way. Yes. So now I'm telling my people down in the South, I'm like, you know what? I think I might be coming down there. <laughs> because I ain't trying to go to the, you know, I'm from Chicago. I ain't trying to be in Rikers Island or nothing like that. I don't know what's going on in New York to me. I don't get no pen or whatever with them. I don't know nothing about the politics or nothing. I'm like, and uh, my lawyer was like, I guarantee you I can get you out of this. I can get you out of this. I was like, well, we have a motion to dismiss. They haven't responded to our motion in two months. We don't have another court date. When are they going to respond? She was like, well, right now they just want you to come to court. So in the days leading up, I think I had about a week before uh, they was going to fly me to New York. So the government comes with a deferred prosecution agreement. In that agreement, he says he wants me to admit guilt admit that I uploaded this five minute video with intentions of threatening prosecutors and uh, stay out of trouble for six months and he'll dismiss for two years and he'll dismiss the case and that I would lose any opportunity to sue. I held them accountable on any wow. level. And I was like, no, nah, I can't do that. Now, by this time, I'm making my mind up that I might actually have to go in here. You know what I mean? And I was thinking I'm gonna have to go in here until they respond to this motion to dismiss. Right. But, uh, right when I got out there, he took out the any omission of guilt. He took out the lawsuit, uh, and they just basically gave me a deferred prosecution that if I don't get in trouble for six months, they're gonna dismiss the case completely, and I don't have to pay to you know with federal cases whether you win or lose, it still uh, will show up on your background. But if you get a huh? deferred prosecution. Okay. Yeah, you have to pay for expungement with federal cases, but if you get a deferred prosecution, they'll do it for you. Now, let me ask you this, because we obviously you started out talking about R. Kelly being charged with a RICO, and mm -hmm. how is he charged by himself? And as you're talking, I don't know, my, my wheels are just spinning. Do you think that at any point during this that they were kind of trying to put together a team of people to get him convicted for the Rico? Cause it almost seemed like they were trying to put you with him so that it made sense on people being a part of this quote unquote Rico that they were trying to establish. Do you think that that was going on with you in your situation? No doubt about it. No doubt. In, in fact, uh, the search warrants, the search warrants that they have, uh, the search warrants that they have, mm -hmm. it, they, they laid that, they made that pretty clear. It says, uh, I am a special agent with the United States Department of Homeland Security and have been since October 2017. I am currently assigned to the Homeland Security New York field office and more specifically to a squad that investigate human trafficking. I'm responsible for conducting and assisting an investigation into the activities of individuals and criminal groups responsible for sex trafficking and related uh, offenses. I have had significant training and experience, blah, 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 blah. Based on my training and experience, the facts set forth in this affidavit, there is probable cause to believe that violation of Title 18, United States Code, uh, blah, 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 transmission to assault uh, United States officials, a felon in possession of firearm in position, uh, in firearm in possession or whatever. The probable cause, the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York and Homeland Security New York Field Office have been investigating Robert Sylvester Kelly, also known as R. Kelly, herein and thereafter Kelly, and others for their participation in racketeering enterprise involving, among other things, bribery, extortion, and the production of child pornography. 
transportation of women and girls across state lines to engage in illegal sexual activity, including sexual contact with individuals who are too young to consent to such activity. It goes on to say on September 27, 21, Kelly was convicted in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York following a jury trial of racketeering involving predicate racketeering acts of bribery, United States versus Robert Kelly. Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2, and Jane Doe 3 served as assistant United States attorneys responsible for the federal prosecution of Kelly in the above captain matter on June 29, 2022. Kelly was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. Gunn is a resident of Chicago, Illinois. On the internet, Gunn uses the alias Deboski Gunn and Deboski to post content to various social media accounts. Is of at least September 2021, Gunn was aware of the federal investigation and prosecution of Kelly and discussed that investigation and prosecution and various social media content. On September 3rd, 2021, records from the Eastern District Court for the Eastern District of New York indicate that Christopher Gunn signed into the overflow courtroom attendance. So basically, at this point, what he's saying is... They done follow me off the off the highway mm. to the trial, and I'm just a YouTube blogger, so I'm going to the trial one because I'm curious. Right, Two, right. I want to see for myself, so I don't have to hear somebody else and what they have to say. I wanted to see it myself. That's so he's saying this guy done came up there. He done signed into the courtroom. Uh, we done did an investigation on on R. Kelly, and now. Uh, we are trying to investigate him, but, you know, so basically the search warrant is, is saying that you're trying to investigate me. And I'm going to show you exactly what he said he was, what he was hoping to, to find. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Take your time, brother. Okay. Is right here what he was trying to find. You see that a association with Robert Sylvester Kelly, also known as R. Kelly, mobile payment application records, in, including records from Cash App, records and information related to YouTube account, Debosi Gun, evidence mm -hmm. of preparation for and commission of the subject offenses, including notes, documents, records, photographs, etc. Now, when you uh, run a YouTube channel, most YouTubers have their Cash App on the screen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Everyone that ever sent me a cash app got investigated. Whoa. Names including subscribers' names. Uh wow. names including subscribers' names, users' names, and screen names, addresses, including mailing addresses, residential addresses, business addresses, email addresses, local and long distance telephone connections, records, records oh, of session time to arrests, IP addresses. And this was everybody who I had did protests with R. Kelly, everybody that had bought merchandise from me, I supported my Boy, channel. It's crazy. So they would have pulled all us in together is this mm. criminal Rico. That's what they was, in my mind, that's what, you know, you write a, you go get a search warrant, on the search warrant, you're saying, we investigated R. Kelly. We gave him 30 years uh, for this with minors, these tapes, and this and that and this, and we're looking for association and affiliation with me I don't even see how the two even came together. And then for those prosecutors that prosecuted uh, R. Kelly, you know, two weeks after they arrested me, they all them all them people left. So R. Kelly got convicted June 29th. I got arrested uh, June 18th or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. June something, uh, two three days before he got uh, sentenced. Two weeks right. later, those those three women quit their job. And the mm -hmm. agent uh, on the case, the lead agent, his name was Ryan Shaboot, the guy who almost changed my life forever. See, if they would have came into my house and found a gun, I would have been that super fan. See what I'm yeah. saying? And yeah. it wouldn't have mattered what I said. It wouldn't have mattered that the video was longer than five minutes. Right. Now you have a weapon. So yeah. now you got a case. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Even though you came in here illegally, even though... You put together some smoke screen to make it seem like it was plausible, but when really it was an illegal search on my home, you ran through all of my subscribers' personal email address, bank accounts, and things of that nature uh, on a on a witch hunt. If if you're the lead investigator for Homeland Security on the case of thirty years of predicate acts, and you're looking at me, and I'm only forty years old, 
your your suspect should be in the age frame of R. Kelly. Right, right. You know what I mean? So how could you even in the first place? And I don't see what struck them to want to come down on me for reading uh, the paperwork that's on Pacer, you know, the motions that the government filed, the motions that the defense filed in the R. Kelly's case, as well as the judge's remarks. I will cover the trial, like they say, gravel to gravel. But mm -hmm. I didn't think that me covering the trial or reading the trial would lead to you wanting to investigate me. There were several people on YouTube that talk about the R. Kelly case, yeah, several yeah. people that viewed it. I don't I don't know how it elevated to the you wanting to investigate anybody that subscribed to my page. And and to mm -hmm. take the time to do that, that goes to show the commitment that you had in trying to build this team. I think right. that the agent should have built a team off those parents who exploited their children. They should have built a team off of uh, surviving our county lifetime for how they uh, used a smoke screen to make money off of the world with playing on the strings of things that people take serious as far as kids and sex trafficking and stuff like that. They just played on the strings of us because most of the stuff that they gave uh, uh, us through those documentaries, those people were together for a year or two to make their story for this documentary. You know what I mean? Mm. And seeing the last part of that documentary shows that the government's role in the information that those people that was writers for that production, it was they worked it hand in hand. In my opinion, mm -hmm. the three prosecutors that was on R. Kelly's case were right. ghost writers for surviving R. Kelly. Mm. You know, wow. if I'm prosecuting you and I'm putting out a production on you at the same time and I'm working both and both. You don't have a chance. And R. Kelly's trial is the only trial I've ever seen in my life where the courtroom only had him in there. His lawyer, the jury and the judge. Nobody else was in the courtroom. This is the first trial I ever watched on TV. I'm on the fourth floor. He on the second floor. Mm. And, you know, if you watch something on TV. And when they got somebody testifying, they they got they zoomed all the way out. Right. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? And then you now they got him, you know, that like how this uh stream yard is. Yeah. They have the accuser in one in the top corner over here. They got the judge down here. They had R. Kelly over here at the bottom, and then they had the prosecutor up there at the top. And the prosecutor was standing at a podium. Uh, just going through all these pages and pages and pages of reading and reading and reading. And whoever would be testifying, that'd be so far back where you can't even really. And it, it was just an odd trial. I myself would not allow nobody to take me to a uh, trial where I'm in the courtroom surrounded by a jury and the government. My family ain't in here. My friends ain't in here. You just sitting in here by yourself. That's not a good look for a jury. Right. You know what I mean? So I don't think I would have, they would have been doing trial without me. I don't think I would have sit in, that looked it like a lynching. It looked it like a lynching. Mm -hmm. You surrounded by a jury and the government. You know what I mean? Right, right. Your brother right. is up there. They didn't even let him in the courtroom. Wow. They said COVID-19, COVID-19, but as soon as his thing was over, it was back to regular schedule. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, so at oh, the big, oh, the most ahead. craziest thing, before the judge gave R. Kelly 30 years, she banned me from the courtroom. Wow. Yeah, she banned me that morning and then gave him that 30 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And that's not even legal. You got a right to be in the courtroom. Yeah, she banned me. Right. I didn't know that. I didn't know I was banned until I got picked up. Wow. I didn't know I was banned. I found out I was banned when the lawyer made a motion uh, for a change of jurisdiction. Okay. She said uh, he was banned from the courthouse. I was like, I was banned? I didn't even know that. What was I banned for? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It, same thing I said as far as why are you tracking me going to a trial? You know, they got they even got me signing in. They got the paper that I signed in on. Why are you tracking me going to a trial? From What, what, get, what gave you the right to go in my cash app? What gave you the right to track me coming from Chicago to view a trial. Where's the probable cause for, you know, how this is moving? How, what 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 led to 
suspicious behavior. What gave you probable cause to think that somebody's about to storm a federal building? Now, if I was a super fan and I wanted to help R. Kelly, shouldn't I storm the jail? That's where you at. You ain't in no federal uh, court uh, office. You're going to be at the jail. So the story didn't even make sense. Storming some... I'm not uh, Donald Trump storming no capital. <laughs> It, don't even, it didn't make sense at all. But when they go in front of these juries with these search warrants, all you got to say is, I investigated R. Kelly for child trafficking and this trafficking, and I'm looking for pornography, and I'm looking for this and that, and I've been doing this, and I think he could be in it. Just saying he could be in it, now you're getting away with coming to look for guns and coming to look for this and coming to look yeah. for that. But you use R. Kelly as the key to open the door for all the bogus stuff that I feel. You came in, you know, I got kids. You coming in my house where kids is here. I'm in the MCC while you raiding my house. My family didn't even tell me. So I didn't mm. even know that my house was raided until I got out. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Now, at the beginning, you, you were talking about, you know, when you see different Suburbans and trucks, you get paranoid. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you still um, do you still feel like they may be trying to watch you and track you to get you on something else? Or do you feel no like doubt. That's long? Right. No doubt. They got uh, November 9th is the dismissal date. Okay. And I believe they're going to be up my butt every inch of that. Yeah. That's why I'm about to go out here and pass out these book bags tomorrow. I got 100 book bags I'm going to be passing out. Nice. In November, I'm uh, giving away socks to the homeless. And the reason why I, I'm doing that, one, is I want to give thanks to God because I could have been somewhere in the belly of the beast and I didn't want to be there. And another reason I'm doing it because it is very easy for some, if it's that easy for somebody to give you five minutes and you say, well, he got a background and because he got a background, he might do it. So let's just do all of this stuff. And when you say I got a background, I'm 40. My background when I'm 20 and 19, I'm not 20 and 19 though, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you act like a background, you, you saying that like it was last year, six months right. ago, right. It, these like years ago. So, now that I see how they will portray people and things of that nature, I just want to make sure that I'm always showing a positive image when it comes to the internet. You know what I mean? Because it's very easy for somebody to take a quote. Uh, you see how that gun was in Boosie back pocket? Right. Yeah. It's very easy for this internet to become a tricky thing. And when you come into a courtroom, if you are an agent or an officer of the court, it's very easy for you to scratch the truth off of minor things from the internet you know we we often talk about the power of media and the negative stigma on media and how how strong it could be now this is a, a quote from the new york post in regards to your case christopher gunn 39 is accused of quote unquote threatening to storm the u.s attorney's office in brooklyn in a youtube video last year and allegedly named and menaced the three female prosecutors at the helm of the case according to federal warrant now if you've listened to this interview at all these 37 minutes you clearly know that you went out there to protest you weren't menacing or storming anything. But these words, they carry very significant triggers and power words. And they paint you in a light that you are some crazy dude loving R. Kelly that's out here trying to terrorize women in, in, in wake of your case. So, like, I applaud you for coming out here and trying to change your image and stuff. But on the flip side, how does that make you feel? Because we talk about, like I said, the media and the powers that be and how evil they are. Well, you came face to face with the devil himself in this situation. So how, how do you, what is, has your thoughts or process changed going through what you went through, especially being a YouTuber at one point, you more than a YouTuber now, what, how did your experience change? Like I said, going back to that production of that surviving R. Kelly. And I felt that those three prosecutors worked it hand in hand uh, with that production as far as the narrative that was pushed out. I feel that those same prosecutors uh, pushed out this narrative. I believe that uh, from when I first went down to R. Kelly's trial, what the public don't know is the judge in R. Kelly's trial said, don't bring up the parents. The judge These prosecutors that. throughout their whole prosecution never mentioned the parents. So now if I'm on YouTube and I'm telling people to call your office and tell them to, that these parents need to be charged and we have proof of these text messages from the parents posing as the daughter and you get flooded with all these calls. Of people saying we watched the trial, we read the transcripts, and we feel that this should happen to these individuals. And you probably seen the power that I had 
at that time in social media and it pissed you off and you sent the real power <laughs> to mm -hmm. uh you know pull you back in line i feel that that's what that really was about it you know i believe that they knew all along it wasn't a threat but if we can find a gun in your house you can just put your ass in jail and you can be done with you for good mm. You know, I just thank God that I didn't have a weapon in my house, a drugs in my house, or something I forgot in my house. Right. Because everything just through the power of social media would have been the truth. You already yeah. done laid down the story. You got enough yeah. smoke. Yep. So if you would have found a fire, I would be in it and I'd be gone. So uh -huh. just knowing that and knowing that the government will also use social media as a tool to, uh, get search warrants or to arrest people. You know, that's what I learned out of this. So with the power of social media, I always feel now that it's always somebody's watching. It don't have to be because of uh, the way you're carrying yourself. It's the message that you bring. If the yeah. message that you bring is really something that they know that you know is the truth and they feel that you can tell other people about it, then they will try to stop that message. And I believe my message at that time was, where are the parents of these individuals? If you want me to believe that this man is guilty of all of these crimes with minors that you are saying, these minors that I'm looking at is 30 years old, 40 years old, 35 years old. And you telling me a story of 15 and 16 and 17, there's really no way to verify any of this. Yeah. But when you have a background of accusations like R. Kelly had, it's just easier to pile on. Yeah. You know what I mean? So after having a threat to federal prosecutors, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be somebody else saying, he threatened me, he threatened me, he threatened me. That's going to be your jacket. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if you have people saying that you did this and you did that and you did this with some minor peoples, it just snowballed. And then you get the government to come out with a production like Surviving R. Kelly. It's the perfect storm for disaster. I got one more question for you, brother. Duboski on Gun on the Hip Hop Ascensive Podcast. Definitely appreciate your honesty, candidness, and shedding proper light on the situation because you don't see me you can't google search your name and see anything positive it's all negative you're still that super fan you're still crazy we all know the story um do you know because i mean we see this all the time people take our content they'll clip it up real quick they'll distribute it as their own blah blah blah, blah. it happens all the time yeah in your case do you think i mean how do you feel about that now looking back at it do you think that was a little more deliberate than what yes. we do you think that was a yes. coincidental situation it was the that was deliberate uh because the video was actually nine months old oh shit yeah that video was nine months old the youtube channel was gone that's why i had to wait to get the wow. video so that means that the, the it's my belief that the person that knocked down my youtube channel was holding on this video and he yeah. needed to knock my channel down before he could turn that video in so mm -hmm. it just shows the calculatedness that a person went through to turn that video in and that same person I have seen uh, on pictures at R. Kelly's shoulder. I have seen chase down R. Kelly Sprinter. So oh, R. Yeah. Kelly had people around him that was working for the government. He had people right. around him that was putting him in situations to make his situation worse. This same guy that I'm not going to name, yeah. R. Kelly's case was a state case. This guy come down there while R. Kelly playing basketball and at, at Hoops the Gym. He brings in all of these women, brings in a, a suspicious looking woman because she looked small, but she was of age. And next thing you know, his case is federal. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the lead agent on R. Kelly's case, Ryan Shaboot, had worked it with this quote unquote individual, one who gave him this five minute video and by him giving you so much credible information you didn't vectorize this information you just ran with it because your informant's information had been on the up and up so you felt that what he's giving you is of the same quality but what he gave you was uh a swatting and swatting is something that people don't know about but it's becoming more and more of a thing where uh people make false reports on you false this on you and I had back and forth, tit for tat with this guy. And I believe in retaliation, he did what he did. And in the process, he exposed himself. He exposed uh, the agent on the case as well. And he also exposed 
the prosecutor. So when you see these people on YouTube that that will say they're a mentee of R. Kelly, a cousin of R. Kelly, a godson of R. Kelly, those individuals right there more than likely has worked directly or indirectly with the same prosecutors and agents on this case. Right. Mm. Even like we look at um Fred Hampton. Mm. It was his bodyguard. Like it's gonna be somebody close to you. It's gonna be around you for a lot of time that can get as much information. Fred Hampton, uh, right. son, was my neighbor for many years, uh, the chairman, Fred Jr. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so Chicago. I, there you go. It, yeah, it, you yeah, got to yeah. think, once we start doing these protests, if the protesters that we did, they was hitting the shade room. Michael Report was talking about it. I went on court TV and talked about it. And I believe that, you know, we when we did these protests, we would say, free R. Kelly, free R. Kelly. But we also said one man ain't no enterprise. The government needs to start telling lies. Where are the parents? Where are the parents waiting on the motherfucking lifetime check? And I believe that once those protesters became bigger and bigger, because mm -hmm. we would get buses to take people to R. Kelly's house, to the studio. If we came to protesters, the protesters mm -hmm. end with a bus picking you up and taking you to his house, taking you to his studio so you could see it. And I marketed it. And it was all fun. But with those protesters about R. Kelly, you're going to have people that don't like it and people that do like it. And then in the midst of it, you're going to have people that I believe that the government sent out as provocateurs to oh, see yeah. what you're doing, to see what you're saying. Sure. And some of those people, uh, when they don't have information, they plant information. Mm -hmm. Powerful, man. Powerful. Thank you for, like I said, dropping your honesty, man. And because... I'm sure you still feel threatened. You said you walk, walked into the conversation that you still feel paranoid. So, but just drop your honesty, man. We appreciate you. If there's any lasting remarks you got, any um, place that people can can receive your information or anything like that, brother, the floor is yours, man. We definitely appreciate your time. Uh, I want to just say that if you like R. Kelly, I don't like R. Kelly. The law is the law. One man is not a criminal enterprise. Walmart is not ran by one person. Target is not ran by one person. The R. Kelly brand and music was not distributed or made by one person. Uh, I also think that we as people, black people, should always know when it comes to accusations involving a child that there should be parent accountability. And uh, I just want to thank God for being free. I want to thank y'all for letting me on your, your show. And I want to give a shout out to the people that uh, had their information compromised because they sent me a cash app or because they supported my channel. Uh, shout out to the enterprise, Kill Steppers. And uh, everybody that's watching this, I always just remember that everything you see in the media ain't always what you think it is. Because the only black person I seen get a deferred prosecution from the government is uh, those security guards that was watching Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. So I'm lucky to get a deferred prosecution. I'm lucky. Appreciate you, brother. Definitely here on the Hip Hop Uncensored podcast. Great interview. And be safe out there, brother. Appreciate you. Please be with y'all. All right, brother. Appreciate Peace. you, man. Thank you.